Welcome back. The communications officer of ICA, Emerson Nurse, says the council is concerned about why religious leaders would remain silent throughout the journey of the cannabis movement, only to issue comment as the work of advocates begin to prove successful. This comes after the Pentecostal Church raised objection to the decriminalization and legalization of cannabis and even wrote to the Prime Minister and the Cabinet of Ministers. Communications Officer of the Ayanola Council for the Advancement of Rastafari, Emerson E. Nurse, says in an attempt to understand the position of the Pentecostal Church on cannabis reform, he took to the Holy Bible for some understanding as to why they oppose the use of cannabis. What he found only left him more perturbed as to why the religious leaders would oppose the use of a natural substance, one which he noted contains seeds. Genesis 1.29 Then God said, Behold, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit contains seed, they will be yours for food. That right there was an extract from no other book than the Holy Bible, and that's the first book in the Bible. He says though cannabis is not directly mentioned in the Holy Book, there are other prominent facts of the time which have not made a cameo in the Bible. Nurse says he is taken aback further by the timing at which religious leaders have chosen to join the conversation on cannabis. People could argue that yes, the word marijuana might not be in the Bible, the word cannabis might not be in the Bible. There's a lot of things that are not in the Bible. Things like dinosaurs, internet, COVID-19. So does that make those non-issues? Do you sweep those under the rug? You don't talk about them, you don't pay them any reverence. I mean, it would have been nice if um, I would have seen some pronouncement from the church ever since February, for instance. But I mean, instead we see little publicity stunts like this one, where marijuana is in the, in the, in the forefront and then um, people want to latch on to it, I mean, for whatever purposes. I don't know if it's advertisements for, for new members. He compares the sacramental use of cannabis to that of wine in many religions, noting that there are plentiful documented adversities to the use of alcohol. The churches revere wine as their sacrament. Yes, wine is legal, but wine is also alcohol, which is arguably the most dangerous drug in the world. And we don't want to go into the effects of alcohol. I mean, alcohol is a top killer among other um, adverse effects, you know, on, 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 on the human being. So all these things must be taken into account. Nurse says from his analysis, the Bible explains that a closeness to nature translates to a closeness to God. And what better to use as a sacrament than something he placed on earth since its very inception. Jaka Wooding, Hot 7 News. The OECS does not have a definitive stance on the decriminalization and subsequent legalization of cannabis. That is according to the Director General of the OECS, Dr. Didicus Jules. He says all he hopes is that governments take a structured and strategic approach to decriminalization and legalization and that they do right by small farmers. St. Vincent and the Grenadines was the first OECS member state to decriminalize cannabis for medicinal and scientific research, though under a tightly controlled framework. Steps are being taken to decriminalize and subsequently legalize cannabis in St. Lucia. Director General of the Eastern Caribbean States, Dr. Didicus Jules, has indicated that the OECS has not bonded to formulate one opinion. However, he believes governments need to be very strategic with the decision. Well, the OECS has no um, defined position on that. We've not something that we have discussed at an OECS level. Um, there is a general movement throughout the Caribbean. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, they've taken a very deliberate approach to this, very studied. Um, they have taken it in different phases. Um, our position, if anything, would be that we ask governments to be very deliberate in how they roll this out. It is his hope that all governments include people who were already involved in the trade long before it became legal as a sure way to increase employment and boost economies. The other key thing I would, want, I would hope that governments would do in going forward is not to exclude those young persons, especially the unemployed um, young persons, 
you know, less educated young persons who have been in the marijuana trade, who are now being supplanted now that the thing is becoming legal. You find a lot of rich people now want to get into marijuana production. Um, I think those persons who have suffered from the trade when it was illegal should be the ones being transitioned into the legal utilization of the trade. Dr. Jules says with the decriminalizing of the cannabis industry, the expansion of criminal records for people who were once convicted or incarcerated for cannabis is very important. This, he says, should be the first step of establishing a legal framework for cannabis. Reporting for Hot 7 News, I am Genevieve Gonzaga. The National Youth Council is offering recommendations to the government on how to deal with social ills which are contributing to crime and issues of mental health among young people. More in this report from Jaco Wooden. The loss of any life by unnatural causes should be concerning to a government, especially when a country's crime and mental health statistics begin to reflect on its death rates. According to World Bank statistics for 2018, St. Lucia's death rate has peaked at 7.8 for the first time since 1975. Public Relations Officer for the National Youth Council, Edison Lane, says this is a worrying statistic, noting that it has coincided with a peak in the island's crime index and male suicide rate. He believes that this speaks to a flawed socialization process, whereby young people are not properly trained to respond and deal with trauma. We know that, again, there are, there's a need for a lot of support within our communities. There's a need for mentorship and a need for intervention quite early in the process to mitigate the development of these behavioral issues. And certainly we know that this is something that we're dealing with now on a national scale, being the effects of quite a few causal issues which have been mentioned. So on this scale, we really need to readdress and look at our, our approach to crime from the crime prevention standpoint. Lane says local authorities have shown the ability to pool resources and mitigate troubling times, lauding their success in the COVID-19 pandemic. He says a similar approach is needed to address obvious gaps in crime prevention and mental health support. He calls on local authorities to pay closer attention to the root causes of such issues. We also need to take into account that this needs as an aggressive uh, as an approach as we would have used for COVID-19. We need as an aggressive of an approach as we would have used for COVID-19 because such, an, such a situation and incidences which we have been seeing requires as much the isolation of the issues and looking into it very deeply, but it also requires the same level of education, the same level of public awareness that we can actually mitigate these situations from its budding point from the point within the communities where we can actually begin to implement this mentorship concept and not in a superficial fashion but to create spaces for it as well as to facilitate it and really draw in to that point of bring out of raising our youth of our youth within the community which would become very important in the coming years even more so now it goes past the public health concept that we use in dealing with our physical health and it goes even more so into programming into facilitative and consultative work that we really need to provide to our young people, that we really need to, as a, as a nation that is, as a nation that is, to address and of course to look into within all our sectors and tying in our resources of course to look at this issue, just as important as any other societal issue. Mental health itself develops from trauma, so there's no real way to, to determine exactly what someone is going through unless you begin to, to have them express themselves until you begin to, to really inquire. And for us to do these things on a wide scale, we really require the resources of a number of sectors. He applauded local advocates for their efforts to draw attention to the need for greater government intervention on social and mental health aspects of crime. Lane says such issues should be top priority for local authorities. As in the case of death, there is only prevention and no cure. Jacko Wooding, Hot 7 News. The Grosley Minibus Owners Association has come to the assistance of members whose children were successful at the 2020 Common Entrance Examination. President Danny Edwards says given the tough times that the country is facing, the association felt it necessary to offer assistance where it could. Twelve students received checks of $500 each. Geneve Gonzag has more.
It is undoubtedly a very difficult period for anyone who is living through the COVID-19 era and with the prospect of schools reopening soon, parents may be in an even tighter position. The Grosile Minibus Owners Association came to the aid of its members whose ward successfully completed the 2020 Common Entrance Examination. President of the association, Danny Edward, presented 12 parents with checks of $500 each during the course of Thursday, 6 August. He says the initiative is not new, but he is certain that this time around it will be appreciated a lot more. This is a project that we normally undertake. It's we've been going on for years to just help out with um, the school books, and we all know how difficult it is this time. So we, we felt that that $500 would go a long way. So this is what we, we were doing this morning. Edward says the initiative was welcomed by the drivers and they all showed extreme gratitude. Hot 7 was present when one recipient, Bernard Modest, received the check. And not only did he express thanks and explained how welcome the initiative was, but he also requested that the initiative continue. Well, many bus associations, I think they do very good, more than the government, to give a whole $500. And it's a small business. It's good, I'll go buy, maybe I'll buy his uniform and buy um, a school shirt or something. Something going to work. It's very good. I appreciate it. Well, I, I, I appreciate the association. I, I want them to do that every year to help people out. I mean, when you do good, give them a check. It's very good. Edward explained that it brought the association great joy to be able to help out members, particularly now, and it is something they will continue. Reporting for Hot 7 News, I am Janine Gonzalez. This is the Hot 7 TV Nightly News. Sports and weather are coming up after the break.